Well, actually, um, this would be a good opportunity because we also have Natalie Watson, um, they, them, and also Vanity that will be joining us. Um, just a quick thing about Mandy Carter. I am here in Durham, North Carolina, uh, moved here in 1982 from San Francisco, California, and have been a member of an out black lesbian community for quite some time. I'm excited about this conversation because if people think back real quick, we used to have just the G word gay. Then we added L for lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gender nonconforming. So the conversation, specifically because Natalie will share this as well, um, this Sunday, Saturday, is going to be actual Transgender Day of Remembrance. So I want to turn it over to Natalie um, to share about that before we can have jo Gloria join us. Natalie? Um, hi, all. My name is Natalie Watson. I use they, them, their pronouns, and I am the deputy director of the LGBTQ Center of Durham. I am joined by my coworker, Vanity Reed Dieterville. Um, she is the co director of Project FAM um, and is actually one of the people hosting uh, the Trans Day of Remembrance this Saturday. So, Vanity, if you don't mind, I'd like to throw it to you to speak a little bit more about the uh, events we'll be holding this weekend. Thank you, Natalie. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for bearing with me as I got logged in. <laughs> My name is Vanity Dieterville. Um, I was serving at the LGBTQ Center of Durham as the Gender Resources Advocacy and Support Program Director. I'm now serving as the Project FAM uh, Co-Director of Advocacy and Gender Support. Um, this Saturday, in Durham Central Park from 7 to 9 p.m., we'll be having our first Transgender Day of Remembrance back in person since 2019. Um, and so we want folks to really come out, uh, fellowship with us for this event. Even though it's a solemn tone to the event, I think it's necessary to keep us grounded in the work that we do and remind us why we're here in the places with the leverage that we have. Uh, we have speakers like uh, one of our wonderful board members, Candace Cox of Equality NC, as well as Senator Wiley Nickel and Reverend Marilyn Bowens of Imani MC Church. Um, so if you can, please come out uh, Durham Central Park, Saturday evening, 7 to 9 p.m. Um, it would be great to have as many people there for our first one back since before the pandemic. Like that. And also, I want to share some exciting news while we wait for Gloria. I was just reading this um, from Equality North Carolina and the Campaign for Southern Equality. You both might have heard about this. But on November 8th, Durham County passed a non-discrimination ordinance protecting all Durham County residents from discrimination based on gender identity, sexual orientation, natural hairstyle, disability, and more. And a quick quote from Equality North Carolina. We are grateful that these protections have come to North Carolina's sixth most populous county in a state which profound in inequality and injustice. So we're so pleased to see this ordinance protect our communities, particularly those experience multiple layers of marginalization. This ordinance will bring us to well over a quarter of people protected from dis discrimination in our state. And we know that the momentum from this will take us further. For more information, Equality North Carolina, north.org, and also the Campaign for Southern Equality. So I'm going to ask both you, Natalie, and um, Vanity, what does this mean about Durham, where we all live? What's the impact of this going to have and will have going forward? Well, this is huge. Um, the city of Durham passed this ordinance, I want to say this past summer. They were one of the first... I want to say in the state that passed this ordinance. And so the fact that the county has got on board is great. Um, it speaks to a lot of what I love about Durham is the fact that I'm able to exist as a black, queer, trans, non-binary person and know that, you know, while I might not agree with everything the government does, <laughs> they're definitely getting on board to actively trying to protect my, people like me. Um, and that says a lot when your city and county sees you and recognizes you and understands, uh, or at least understands from a, 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 a maybe a surface level, the, the idea of discrimination and the things that we're facing and that they are going to act actively try to stop those things from happening. Or if it does happen, there's now a recourse. Um, I think that's a huge thing. I think folks make a lot of assumptions about the South mm. and they're not true. 
they are not true. There are plenty of proud, queer, black, trans folks in the South, and we're not leaving. Mm -hmm. like so it. folks need to get on board. <laughs> <laughs> Vanity, when you want to add anything to that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it shows to echo uh, some of Natalie's sentiment. I think it shows that there is progress being made, that we are moving in a sort of a direction. Um, I think it also reminds us of the progress that's being made in the midst of the many legislative assaults queer and trans people have experienced from the General Assembly of North Carolina over the past year. I think we'd be remiss to not keep those things mindful um, in order to continue the work that we need to do because we have a lot more protections to put in place and to enact. This is just a start, good. but it's a good start. Oh, good start and good news. I think Gloria has joined us now. Gloria, are you with us? Hope so. Gloria? Wendy, is she back yet? I see her on the panelist list. I have her, but I'm trying to get her sound now. Okay, great. Well, you know, while-, while There she while, is, there she is. Great. Uh, Gloria. <laughs> Beautiful. Hello from Durham, North Carolina to you, Gloria. Oh, there you are. Can you hear us, Gloria? Waiting for the sound. Just checking to see. Gloria, up. Oh, we're getting there. Patience, my friends, we're getting there. Still got a great conversation. Gloria, hello, can you hear me and see us? Okay. I think we're getting, ah, Gloria, can you hear and see us? I can Mandy see. Great. Well, as long as you can hear us, the important part is that we want to say welcome. We're bringing you greetings from Durham, North Carolina. Have you ever been to North Carolina before, Gloria? I have family there. Um, where? Yeah. Uh, I, let's see. I don't know. I. I know Rock Hill or someplace. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And you know, Charlotte's the largest city, which also passed a non-discrimination ordinance. We're here in Durham, North Carolina. We're here with the, one of the 11 historically black colleges in the state of North Carolina, Gloria, North Carolina Central University, yeah. which is really great. So uh, because we, yeah. we now have you back, we want to welcome you. And we want to start the conversation off with a few questions for you. And then we're also joined with Natalie um, from the Durham LGBTQ Center and Vanity as well. And we'll have some questions with them. And then we wanna open it up for kind of a back and forth with you and really talk about just how wonderful this is. The timing is spot on. Uh, Transgender Day of uh, Remembrance is gonna be this Saturday, November 20th, but we have you here on the 18th. <clears throat> so are you ready for us to go ahead and get started with you? Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what I said. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got to take a drink of water. Sorry. Mm. So let's get started. Welcome, Gloria. <clears throat> what was it like making the documentary Mama Gloria? Here's a couple of questions uh, and then you can you can do it all in one. Okay. okay? So so one okay. part one is what what has been the response to you in the film and what do you think it says about you? Okay, making the film was uh, me, and um, I've met so many wonderful people doing this documentary, and I have to give a shout out for Lucina Fisher. She did such an amazing job, and uh, I've gotten a lot of response from other people saying that they just came out and they are so proud that I was able to tell my life story and what I had to go through. And I'm so proud to be a part of this and that if I can inspire anybody to come out of the closet, so be it. You know, I'm happy about that. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious when you when you talk about how this has impacted you, but what's been the response from either the community around you? Certainly the film is out and about. We were going to have uh, the, the link in the end for people to be able to get the film, but also maybe Gloria have their own little um, group chats about it. But what's been response from either Chicago? What about have you getting responses from other folks in the South or other parts of the country in terms of the film itself? Yes, uh, all over because I had some people in South Carolina too, and uh, they called me up, and I'm quite known in South Carolina through my sister-in-law. She said that her church members and her friends they watched the film and they were so proud and so happy that they know about me and uh, I'm going to South Carolina next week so I get a chance to meet these people and I'm happy about that and then also I've had friends my high school friends who have called me up and thanked me for doing this project with Lucina and uh the inspiration that I get from these wonderful people. I am so proud and happy and I want other people to get, you know, the same feeling that I have, you know, because um, we all are connected together and we should share our ups and downs. And now my ups are just so happy being here and still thriving and surviving. I like it. And I'm, I was just in South Carolina, Columbia, so I'm, I'm sure they're going to be excited to have you down there. And if, is that going to yeah. be a public event that people can attend or what's going to be the, what's the situation for, or one of these? Um... It's waiting to meet me and greet me because as soon as I get there on the 23rd, I'm going to be, they're going to have some kind of luncheon for me. So I'm looking forward to that. Great. And by the way, there's the Harriet Hancock LGBTQ Center. Well, not open because of COVID, but they're there down in Columbia, South Carolina. So a lot of the work that you have been doing and all of us have been doing has made a difference. Let me ask this next question, Gloria. In your documentary, you said something to the effect of you came out when you came out of the womb. So was your yeah, yeah so was your transitioning so your tr transitioning was not a major ordeal for you or was it? I like that quote. I I came out when I came out of the womb. Say more. Okay. Um I I for some reason I I believe that, you know, because uh, I never had to be in the closet or hide my truth. I've always been Gloria, and I didn't realize it until I got around seven or eight years old. Then I realized, hey, you know, I'm different. I, I'm a girl, and I knew that. I felt that. And... Uh, people would come in contact with me. They thought that this was a phase that I was going through. And uh, they found out it's different. It's not, a, it wasn't a phase. I, I was really being myself because I never did boyish things. Everything was girly for me and with me. And uh, my mother knew it, you know, she said I was always a special, sweet person, and she knew that, and I always had that in me, so I really just brought it out to the world, to my family, and uh, they, they could really, you know, be a witness and say things, yes, um, you know, I had the boy's name. But I was a girl. Like that. You know, I'm thinking with the holidays coming up, uh, we'll get to another question that I'm going to also share with Natalie and Vanity as well with you. 
Um, but one wonders, like, you know, when you think about family, um, how some family members might be accepting or understanding, and then others might have you, were there any members in the family where there was a little pushback or because you really felt you had the love of the family that was, that really kept grounded you, if that's a good way to put that, Gloria? Okay, well, with my family, I have to say I'm truly blessed because my mother, grandmother, and great aunt, they were always there for me. And they stood with me with my back up against the wall and they protected me and loved me. And the word gay and uh, sissy and uh, another term that I can't recall now, but um, my family was all about love. And um, that love that they gave to me, I projected that back to them. And uh, so, you know, I can't see how family members would um, reject their child because their child is different. Everybody's different and they need to realize that, you know, we all are not going to be the same, but we got that basic ingredients in ourselves, which is love. Mm. And if you put that love out, you're going to get that love back. So that's my thing about it, you know, but um, all my family, my siblings, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, and my cousins, I never had any problems with them. They accepted me for being who I am. I like it. I think it's great. And also just to highlight for you, I'm thinking, sitting here thinking about a number of the national organizations here in the country. Uh, one of them is called the National Black Justice Coalition, uh, NBJC, started about 20 years ago. That's sort of a civil rights organization, Gloria, that includes the black LGBT same gender loving community, but also working with our traditional civil rights organizations as well to really talk about full equality and justice for all. I would say to you, one of the highlights was in uh, the 100th anniversary of the NAACP. Julian Bond, one of the first black members of the Georgia um, house down in Georgia, formally formed with the National Black Justice Coalition. Um, it was called the uh, L N B uh, N NAACP National Black Justice Coalition LGBT Task Force, game changer. And not that we understand sometimes within our respective communities of color, that's an issue, but for that to have happened, um, really important. So before my next question, I was gonna also share with Natalie and Vanity about, you probably know this as well, or other people can feel this, especially those working in governments around the changing of hearts and minds, but also the changing of public policy. And sometimes one comes before the other or they're kind of you know blended together, like interracial marriage would be an example, or now we have marriage equality that happened as well. So to have you and others being on the front lines of this and exemplifying how this could really make a possibility for you. So before on my next question, before you came on Gloria, we talked about a very important Thing that happened here in Durham County, North Carolina, and it's happening elsewhere. Um, Durham County, where we are, uh, un unanimously passed an LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, and queer inclusive non-discrimination ordinance. And essentially, um, uh, our, our organization, Equality North Carolina, and the Campaign for Southern Equality were active but the bottom line, it says that essentially when you pass a county ordinance, it advance, it's an ordinance practicing protecting county residents from discrimination based on gender identity, sexual orientation, natural hairstyle, disability, and more. And so for, for, for organizations to pass these kind of city, town, and ideally we would love to start thinking about the passing on the state level of these ordinances would really be important. And thanks to organizations that are sponsoring this today to the, to the state of North Carolina, it really does make a profound difference. And for those of us living in multiple identities, I'm black, I'm a lesbian, I'm a woman, you know, I'm a southerner. So I think about how that impacts you and me and how we move that forward. So I just wanted to share that piece of good news for you. And you're Chicago, Illinois probably has similar 
ordinance as well, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes. Go? yes. Okay. So my other question, next one, this gets to, and the reason why this is important, and we'll bring this up also with Natalie and Vanity. In your document, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, did you struggle more during your professional life? And if so, how and to what degree did you overcome it? I'll repeat my question. Did you struggle more during your professional life? If so, how or to what degree did you overcome it? Well, in my life, um, I went through a lot, you know, back in the day that I was blossoming out. It was a lot of people who didn't understand me. They rejected me and I had to stand up and fight for my rights. And I did, you know, I was very outspoken. I didn't hide, you know, I didn't want people to look down upon me because, hey, I'm special, I'm gifted, and just like anybody else, you know, I bleed the same blood they bleed, but uh, they need to stop this mess that's going on. You know, we still fighting for our rights, and I believe we're going to continue to do that because it's still a lot of people out here that are prejudiced to everything. You know, if you're fat, you know, you're messy looking and all of that. You know, if you're not happy with yourself, you know, don't take it out on us. And um, I look at it this way, you know, because a lot of people, you know, by being in the Bible Belt, it was a lot of people, family, friends of mine that I grew up with and came up with. They didn't like me. I was going to, I was hell bound that they thought that, you know, and uh, they need to stop that because God is all about love. When he put us here, he put us here with the image of love. We're supposed to love one another, care about each other. And uh, if we all were the same, this would be such an, a boring world and we're not supposed to be like that. Love one another, one another, but we have lost that. And today, what the world needs now is love. And believe me, that is slowly dissipating away, you know, because we don't practice that, you know. And I fought some of the churches too. Churches, especially here in Chicago, they discriminate against everything, you know, they, they discriminate against being a uh, gay, lesbian, uh, LBGTQ. It's so many acronyms that, <laughs> that are out there. I get lost in the commotion, but hey, I'm still going to fight for our rights and my rights. And we need to realize that because we were made in God's image. And uh, if you're not happy with what's going on, then you don't love God. And I love God to the fullest. You know, I know that he has put that rooted love into me and I'm supposed to share it with everybody. I like that. I was also thinking of the church. I'm thinking particularly we have a an organization called the Unity Fellowship Church Movement, which is really made up for black churches, but welcoming and accepting and have to um, get some tears for the late Carl Bean, who was one of the founders of the Unity, Unity Fellowship Church Movement, but where people can try to find a home where they feel like they can be. But you also have the Unitarians and Quakers and the list goes on and on. But I was thinking of also the faith based community and how important it is to have advocates and the faces and voices of those who believe in that as well. Um, on the other hand, without getting into too much drama, um, we do have some pushback and uh, I think the 
Black uh, NBJC, Black National Black Justice Coalition and others actually come up with some ministers and faith-based leaders willing to speak up and speak out about why it would be important to be inclusive, you know, for that reality um, and also other communities of color as well. So I've got one more final question before I want to bring in our other two guests, Natalie and Vanity for you. Um, one of the questions, I think I have it here. Oh, wait a minute. Let me find it. I had it on my list. Oh, here we go. Uh, it's about family. I was asking the question. Bear with me. Ah, okay, this is one. And then I'll introduce Natalie and Vanity. As we can, I, I want to ask this question about our non trans friends and allies. This is a question for our non trans friends and allies. And I also then want to have you respond that um, Gloria and then loop in both Natalie and, and vanity with this. Here's the question. What would you say? Or have said to a person who has a trans family member or friend. I'll repeat the question. What would you say? or have said to a person who has a trans family member or friend? We'll start with you, Gloria. Natalie, if you would like to follow, and then Vanity, if that's okay. That's the question for our non-trans family and friends. Okay, um, non-trans family and friends. Yes. I've never experienced any bad situations because I've always been an outgoing person. I get into that segment of life to help out with everybody. And uh, I put myself out there because I believe I'm a, a love child. You know, God put me here. He loves me so much. And I love myself and everybody and uh, everywhere coming up as a kid as a teenager i never been discriminated against at all and a lot of people say well how is that well it's the people that i socialize and commu communicate with and uh, uh my uh great aunt which was a slave She's dead now, and I was around with her, and she was a big member in the church, but her church, everybody accepted me for being Gloria, and I was so happy about that, and my grandmother, the same way, my grandmother would tell people, why are you trying to hurt my grandchild? And um, I remember one time in a conversation, this lady, she had a child that was not able to do for herself. You know, she was uh, up in age, but she was confined to a baby's bed, a crib. And uh, they would have to go in there and massage her legs and everything. And then this lady told my mother, she said, oh, I don't know how you put up with a, a child. And my mother said, let me put you in your place. My child might be gay or is gay, but my child can take care of themselves. And when they grow up, they're going to be productive and they will be able to do for themselves. Nobody's going to have to rub her legs down, you know, and uh, my mother said, you know, you might not like what I'm saying to you, but it's true. And the truth still set you free. I appreciate that. Well, Natalie, um, Deputy Director of the LGBT Center of Durham, go by they, them. Would you like to respond? Again, the yeah, question. So yes. Um, I think one thing that's important for uh, allies, specifically non-trans um, folks, family and friends of trans folks, is to understand that um, trans people are not a monolith, and everyone has a, a different narrative and a different story. 
So, as um, Ms. Glory has spoken to, some folks face discrimination, some folks don't. Some folks have accepting family and friends, some folks don't. Um, everybody has a different story and a different narrative. So, what I can say is when it comes to being an ally, you need to just, you need to be there for your, your, your trans friends and family members. Um, you need to see them for who they are and trust in what they're telling you. So if they're telling you this is my name, they're telling you this is my pronouns, regardless of whether or not you understand, respect it. And don't put the burden on your family member and your friend to try and get you to understand and to try and get you to feel empathy and sympathy. You should come to them with the empathy of understanding and then take the time yourself. I recognize that the internet can be a both a helpful and hurtful tool. So what I can suggest, there are many documentaries featuring um, trans folks of color. I would start there. Uh, you can start with Miss Gloria's uh, documentary. There's one about Miss uh, Miss Major, who's also um, a well-known Black trans elder. Um, there are other LGBTQ documentaries that you can look up, and then follow LGBTQ centers. A lot of them have resources on their websites that give you LGBTQ 101s, that talk to you about pronouns, that talk to you about conversations. Do the work to support your family and friends. Show that you care by putting in the work and show up for them when no one else is, when they're not around. So if someone is using the wrong name and someone's using the wrong pronouns, you can politely correct someone and say, hey, this is their name, this is their pronouns, let's keep it moving. If you see someone actively disrespecting a trans person in public, take the burden off the trans person and say something, or you can also read the situation because trans people can also speak up for themselves. There's a lot of nuance there, but at the end of the day, it's about respecting people for who they are and not trying to create like this one way of trying to address it. It's all built around respect. And then Vanity Reed Dieterville, if I'm saying that correctly, you're the Center's uh, Program Director of Pro Project FAM. If you wanna share your thoughts about the question and also what is Project FAM? If you'd like to share that with Gloria and the rest of us. Um, <clears throat> Project FAM is uh, folks aiming for more, which encompasses uh, survivor and um, housing and therapy services as well as, well as gender and advocacy support services. So. Um, things ranging from therapy, um, linkage to care, uh, housing, temporary housing, um, emergency, um, temporary housing, uh, funding as it relates to QT, BIPOC folks, queer, trans, Black, and Indigenous people of color impacted by the ongoing pandemic, um, a closet uh, for our trans and gender non-conforming individuals, a name change navigator program to assist in that program, um, and now an ongoing pipelines to employment uh, effort that uh, I am spearheading to create pathways to local businesses and referral processes for our clients at the center to have uh, more inclusive, welcoming, and sustainable um, employment, and really making sure that we emphasize the steps, the multi-steps needed to be taken in order to get folks to a better quality of life overall. Um, that's what Project FAM is in a snapshot. And I believe the question was, um, what would we tell a family or a friend that has mm -hmm. um, a trans person or who knows a trans person? Yes. Mm -hmm. is close to them. Um, Natalie mentioned how much information is on the internet and it is very useful. Um, I would advise taking your time. Um, you know, I'll say, for instance, my mother and my relationship is the best it has been in several years. Um, but it took lots of very intentional work to get there. There were a lot of arguments. There were a lot of heartbreak. There were some disrespectful things said. There were many years apart. Um, there were mediators for discussions. There were articles shared for awareness. There's no one right way to do this, but there are materials and resources, whether that be online, whether that be in lived experience and physical people, whether that be from personal lessons learned in the past. Um, take the time and recognize that repairing a, a relationship that's worth investing in isn't always a cookie cutter process. 
sometimes it's best, like Natalie said, to take the time to yourself away for an extended period, but recognize it will be up to you to determine whether maintaining relationships with certain people is causing you more harm than it is benefiting you. Mm. And that is what protecting your peace is about and finding your tribe and your chosen family and your circle and the people who surround you with love, like Mama Gloria said, mm -hmm. continually and encourage you to do better and be your best self. So take your time, use the resources there, but know that no one's forcing you to maintain anything that might be causing you harm. And before I get to the next question for all three of you, I just wanted to make sure people knew that the LGBTQ Center was founded in 2015 and is committed to serving the city and county of Durham as well as the surrounding counties to ensure all folks have resources necessary to, full, to live full, joyful li lives. The center, through services, programming, resources, and support networks that center well-being and allows them to thrive. And I think we're going to put some uh, links in the chat, if I'm not mistaken. Um, before, then I want to ask, I want to go the other way. One thing I noticed, <clears throat> Gloria, Natalie, and Vanity, <clears throat> We also, Gloria, you talked about the idea of dealing with young people. What about elders? There's a whole issue right now of elder insecurity in terms of housing, food, home, travel. And if you overlay that with communities of color, what that might be. Here in Durham, if I'm not mistaken, right now, the Durham city is now is majority people of color, Latinx, people of color, black, whatever it might be. But any of you can address either at the center or Gloria, what about the elders? What do we do with those people who have no place to go or feel like they've been rejected from family or really what can be provided um, personally and also just organizationally for those people? I'll start with Gloria and then Natalie and Vanity. What would be your response to all our LGBTQ elders? By me working at the center on Halsted, this is a place designed for the elders and the youth. And uh, the Center on Austin has really been, uh, I mean, a wonderful thing for us. You know, I'm up in the age and uh, I remember the time when I was coming up as a young person, if they found out you were gay, lesbian or whatever, they wouldn't rent to you, you know, because I've had apartments that I tried to get and um, I was told, you know, we don't rent to your kind. And I couldn't believe that, you know, I could pay my own rent. I don't need nobody else to help me out. But I'm so elated and happy over the things that's going on today because there are so many programs and so many groups that help with the lesbian, the LBGTQ community and they're thriving and it works well. I try to get my elders to join things, help out, but a lot of them still don't want to because they caught up being uh, in the closet. They can't get out of the closet because of the hangers and the wires and everything. They're scared to go through them. And uh, I talk to them, you know, and they still have that mentality, you know, especially with the trans older people. They want to and be with the you for the wrong reason. Instead of helping them out, they're trying to secure a comfy place with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so sad. Don't do that, you know, but um, they do it and they going to continue to do it. You know, it seems like they just thrive on taking the youth out of the youth. They want that that thing and uh, I try to talk to, to them I tell them get to know the you you know 
sit down with them, talk to them, and the youth will sit down and talk to you too. So it's a um, combination there, work together and do things right together. I like that. Natalie, any response or, and also then vanity, the issue of LGBTQ elders. Yeah, um, so I think some folks get caught up in, in, like you said, helping youth and like a fixation on one thing, right? When it's a whole expansive generational thing of LGBTQ folks, LGBTQ folks can be of any age. And so we have to address support and programming and advocacy for folks at any age. Um, I know that there's a national organization that does that, um, which is SAGE. Um, seniors and advocacy for LGBTQ elders, um, and they are based out of New York. Um, the LGBT Center of Raleigh has essentially a chapter of SAGE, SAGE of Central North Carolina. So they provide um, a lot of social outings and get togethers. Right now it's been socially distanced. So like it's walks, like six feet apart um, <laughs> and lunches. And they've connected with um, organizations that usually provide uh, services for elders. Mm. So working with coming in home, or if you're having to be in a residential facility, they've actively been working to try and have more LGBT, at least lesbian gay conversations about mm. training those folks to understand that you do have this population that's coming into your businesses and how to interact with folks. Um, the LGBTQ Center of Durham started the uh, Friends Aging Quirkly FAQ Ooh. back in 2020, and it was a partnership between the Durham Center Transitions Life Care and the Durham Center for Senior Life. Uh, folks recognize that like elders are out there and we do have a large amount. Y'all Durham is a haven for LGBTQ history, especially black lesbians y'all black lesbians are in Durham anyways. Um, and we got folks under the over the age of 50. I go back and forth with the term elder because I think it, you know, depending on who you are, it's a, it's a term of respect. Mm. Yeah, there are folks who are over 50 who, mm. you know, want to be able to live their lives with their partners, but spent so much of their life either in the closet or constantly calling somebody a roommate. And like, what does it mean to be an elder in 2021? What does it mean to live in a world where you have youth who are coming out of very young ages and you still, you know, are holding on to some of those things? So it is to see that more LGBTQ organizations uh, reach out to the elder populations. Um, I know with our program, the Friends Aging Quirkly, uh, parts of it were moved online so that we were establishing relationships for folks to call and or write letters to elders in Durham and surrounding areas so folks can keep that connection, specifically started during the pandemic. Um, so looking like what does that you know look like transitioning outside of that? but. Um, you can definitely, if you're interested in that more, you can actually email FAQ at LGBTQCenterDurham.org mm -hmm. to learn more information about that. It looks like um, folks becoming advocates when it comes to understanding like end of life care. Mm. It means actively, if you're in those fields, if you do hospice work, if you work in residential facilities, retirement homes, um, if you provide health care aids, it's doing the work to understand a cultural competency around LGBTQ folks so you can properly work with people so that when you show up in somebody's house and their husbands, or if you show up in somebody's house and they're 75 year old trans person, your, your jaw's not on the floor, you're literally there to help someone. So it's, it's advocacy on both the part of folks who aren't a part of the community and folks who are in the community who aren't of the elder age to work to help people out. I like it. Natalie, do you want to weigh in and then we'll circle back to Gloria with another question for the three of you. I think you mean vanity. Oh, I'm sorry. Natalie, vanity, vanity. <laughs> you, I'm looking at you. And she went, anyway, vanity, my apologies. Vanity. That's all right. Um, yeah, I, I, I think everyone has hit the, the nail on the head so far. Really, when it comes to <clears throat> elders, those who have of older age in our community, um, we have to get creative and thinking about what are the things that they would enjoy that they could also accomplish comfortably, right? I think much of this past pandemic has taught how we can comfort each other, what comfort looks like, how important comfort is in a crisis and in a time of need ongoing, um, which is even more critical for those who have lived this life longer than we have. Um, 
figuring out what they'd like to do. Um, knowing through word of mouth and through prior connections um, through this tree of a community we have in Durham, who knows who, where are the elders at? What are the things they like to do? We have to figure out what they like to do in order to take that to them. Um, and I would only be able to follow the lead in order to make sure that that happened effectively. I like that. And something I like to also, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, um, Natalie, about the idea of uh, FAQ, but also, you know, recently the, the AARP, I'm a member, I'm a card carrying member, and if you're over 50, you will be, but they've been very intentional around inclusive of the LGBTQ community. Um, and I would also raise another organization is called Old Lesbians Organizing for Change. Some people embrace the word old, OLOC.org. But here's something I'll ask the three of you. I've been really intrigued about something here in North Carolina, and I'm not sure about where you are, Gloria, in Illinois. We have way overbuilt these assisted living facilities that are sitting empty. So one of the thoughts was what would happen if there were a campaign? You know, there's community land trust where people buy a home and it stays in the community. But what would happen if we did an inventory of the state of North Carolina or the state of Illinois, just for an example? And found out all these places sitting empty and if they could be either bought or some kind of collaboration, you talked about this, Natalie, with Sage, um, but they would be, they would be permanent. Would so you wouldn't move in and that? out. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gloria. Would you repeat that? What I said is that there's a, there's a, here in North Carolina, there are a lot of overbuilt uh, assisted living facilities, you know, where one would go live if you're in, in aging. But they're sitting empty. So, 1 of the thoughts and ideas was the idea of what would happen if some of these could be bought where elders and young people could actually live. Depending on the numbers that there would be that would be take care of the, the issue of um, housing insecurity for our LGBTQ elders and youth. It's just an idea, but that's 1 of those creative thoughts that you might have looking forward An AARP that always works already with a lot of these assisted living facilities, they have proactively wanted to include the LGBTQ plus community and also particularly of color. But it's just it's just a brainstorm. So I was thinking to ask you, Gloria, Natalie, and Vanity, if you were to put your thinking caps on and thinking about, is that a good idea or not? Are there some examples that already exist that way? Um, and also thinking about the state of North Carolina, how could we really kind of think outside the box? Of what is or isn't allowed for people to age in place, if I can use that term, I think I think that can that's the best I can describe it. But what about that idea of permanent places where elders could live, live out their lives, or youth could live as well? Just a thought, Gloria, and then Natalie, and then Vanity. Response here, here in Chicago, they have a lot of uh, sites, buildings that. The city is taken over and they open up a lot of these buildings for the seniors and the youth. And um, it's a good idea. And, you know, it's a little bit more investigating on these projects should be allowed because um, I know the CHA in Chicago, they have. For seniors, you know, you get a 55, I believe, and you can come into this facility to live in your own apartment and uh, be comfortable there. But uh, a lot of them are not uh, uh, friendly at all. You know, mm -hmm. I've experienced that myself because I moved in a building i was 65 and um i had a lot of uh people that weren't gay friendly at all they didn't want me there in the building i was being stalked by a man in that building and uh it was a nasty situation and uh you know, they need to have more protection for the LBGTQ people in those buildings, too. 
because um, it's still a lot of ignorance that here in the city of Chicago and uh, the community, you have to be careful where you are in the community. It might be a nice building, but the surrounding parts are dangerous for the LBGTQ community. And uh, for the youth, the youth would go into different places where some of the churches were. Ooh, come on, what am I doing? We can hear you. You, you can hear yes. me. Okay. Uh, for the youth and the youth, uh, I hate to say this, you know, they, they are lost. Some of them are, not all, all of them. Uh, they get into these buildings and uh, they don't follow rules. You know, young people, some of them don't like to be told what to do and they keep up a lot of mess, some of them do. Then you got the good ones that come in and they try to maintain the grounds and they love being in there because they were living on the streets, uh -huh. you know, so um, it's a, a situation that I know here in Chicago, we still have to investigate it and have groups to help out with the youth living and the senior living. But I'm so happy that in all over the country that these projects are being brought up and it makes a difference. It really does. And Natalie and Vanity, I'm, I'm also thinking because, you know, we have a hundred counties, we have a lot of rural out there too, besides the city, so, so, sorry. So in response to what either what either one would, what you would share, I I always remember if you might know that um, a mobile homecoming project I think just bought some land not far from Durham, um, and you also then have uh, in Detroit there's the Ruth Ellis Center in which you know remember the 101 year old black lesbian Ruth Ellis they have a center named after her and they're actually creating models of how they can actually have homing so. There's some models, but I'm thinking, what about out in rural parts, you know, eastern North Carolina and even going the other way, western North Carolina? Um, either your experiences or your thoughts about this idea of intentional communities that we could either buy or put into land trust and think that that's a good idea, Natalie, and then Vanity. What do you think, Natalie? Um, yeah, so I know that there are a couple of um, LGBTQ, like senior housing facilities across the US. Mm. Um, I know the folks in Raleigh have been trying to essentially just buy or build their own senior housing uh, facility for LGBTQ elders. Um, I think part of it, though, is there there's an interesting thing that there is some money within the LGBT community, specifically with elders. There are some folks who have some money. Um, and I think it's partly appealing to that crowd and saying, how can we make our lives sustainable until death mm -hmm. and getting folks to invest um, that when they do pass their money is uh, listed in a trust or in a will that goes to an organization or is set aside specifically to pay for housing for LGBTQ elders. That means leaving their personal houses to LGBTQ elders and setting up trust and funds that can help pay for whatever assistance folks may need in those houses. Um, it looks like, you know, folks coming together and figuring out how to combat gentrification, specifically in the cities, and try and buy land, try and get, you know, buildings that already exist, work with assisted living facilities, work with retirement homes. I think part of the issue there is that at the end of the day, money is the bottom line. So, yeah. In order to, to 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 buy out those rooms or do whatever you need to with those with those rooms, it would require money. Um, the other option, um, folks are looking at um, either tiny homes, duplexes, and mobile homes, um, buying up land in rural areas, or working with folks who own the land to kind of essentially appeal 
to their uh, humanitarian side and say, hey, can you work with us? Can we have like a, you know, 70 year lease or something like that where we can build these homes, these houses so that both, you know, LGBTQ youth, I mean, just LGBTQ peer, people period can have housing. Um, I think there's some opportunities out there, but again, the world of fundraising, it, you know, requires some finesse. It requires folks who are willing to say, I'm willing to go to these folks who probably may look at you funny, mm -hmm. but I'm willing to put myself on the line to get that money so that we all can then do what you need to do. <laughs> okay. Vanity. Um, one thing that Natalie said that really stood out to me was the idea of tiny home projects. So ideally, you know, what the center would really love to be able to happen is to acquire our own land and to construct our own mm -hmm. tiny homes. Um, we've been talking about the possibilities and the many ways maybe acquiring land could look like for a center. And I believe some of the elders in our community have already began to be bequeath their homes to our center so that we could repurpose that real property um, for something sustainable, for some housing that's sustainable, for something, a living environment that's controlled by us for us. Um, I feel like that is the only way. I was taught very early from my great grandfather that land ownership equated to power. And mm -hmm. I believe very firmly in that. And so I think we just have to think about the creative ways that we can acquire our land and do with it as we want. Mm -hmm. I like it. Well, we're getting ready to head around the bend. We're getting near the end of the conversation. So we have about 20 minutes left. I have one final question for all three, and then I have a final wrap up for you, Gloria. So here's the okay. question. If this is okay. Um, yeah. So here's the question. We'll start Gloria, Natalie, and Vanity. What is life's biggest lesson that you have learned in each of your relative many years on this earth? Gloria, I'll be uh, that, that question. Yes. Yes, the lesson that I have learned, uh, and I'm so proud to say it, is that um, I love myself first. Mm -hmm. And when you love yourself, you can be, you're able to put that love out there and that love will return to you. And uh, during my lifetime, and like I'm 76 years old, <laughs> excuse me, 76, and I've learned so much on this earth, and uh, it, I've still got a long way to go too. I hope to be here for 20 more years, and I want to be able to share my love and my thoughts and my hopes for the youth and to get along with everybody because um life is so nice if you put the nice side of you out there you know because uh we're not going to be here forever but while we're here we should be able to flourish and do things and help people out and uh i love that because i look at the youth natalie and vanity i think they are so wonderful and so gifted and i am so happy to see this you know i was taught by older people when i was coming up as a teenager and they took me under their wings and they taught me a lot. And I'm so happy about that because everybody, I try to love them and I'm going to continue to try to love them no matter what. You know, I'm here and I'm here to help and the awareness of love should be out there. Love somebody. I like that. So we'll switch it up, Vanity, and then Natalie. Would you like to respond to that? Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Um, the biggest lesson I've learned in my 27, going on 28 years of life. 
uh, is that this life experience is so unconventional, is so unscripted, um, is so historically erased and oppressed um, that the lives that we live right now, the life that I lived, so much has already happened in 27 years um, that I know there's so much more to go through and to fight for because I'm just over a quarter century um, and barely putting a dent into my life, I feel like. I believe I will have a long flourishing life and that I'm very thankful to be situated in the position to where I think that's possible. Um, but I recognize that there's still so much to experience and still so many lessons to learn. So out of the lesson learned, um, life moves very swiftly, um, but also not so much at the same time. And it's okay not to feel as though we are on time, but I don't think we could be any more on time than just truly trying to be our best selves and to thrive and to think about what the future for our lives looks like. I believe that is being on time. Thank you. Natalie? Um, yeah, so I am 34 and um, for anybody who's under the age of 30, y'all get better. Once you hit 30, <laughs> I'm telling you, you just it goes up from there. Um, what I have learned is that while life is short, take your time. Give yourself grace to figure things out. Stuff is going to change when you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, whoever you were when you were 19, it's probably not who you're going to be when you're 70, and that's perfectly fine. Um, there are no set standards. For your for you know who you have to be and who you have to live up to be, um, but give yourself time, give yourself grace, give yourself the ability to explore and figure things out, and you know, give yourself the you know the the permission to fail. Like it's okay as long as you are not actively harming yourself or others. It's okay to fail. It's okay to take missteps. It's okay to try something out and it didn't work. Just always remember to be empathetic and to have humanity and grace when doing that. And try and find whatever happiness looks like for you. It could be just being content, right? Like it could be the fact that you're able to just breathe one day. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Good. Okay. And here we have one final question in the chat, actually. And we'll do this one final uh, question as we get near the end. Um, since the since our audience is primarily from the HR community, human relations, what would you say would be the most helpful to employees that are transgender for us to be supportive allies in the workforce? Again, what would you say would be the most helpful to employees that are transgender for us to be supportive allies in the workplace? We'll go backward. Vanity, Natalie, and then Gloria. In the workplace, allies. Um, I think it's important to be radically honest with ourselves when we are saying that we're trying to be open and aware of someone else's lived experience. Um, in the workplace, when there are power dynamics that are well situated and very evident, depending on the person's race, uh, class, uh, gender, um, education level, anything socioeconomically associated, um, there's a power dynamic that's present in the workplace. And so microaggressive behavior um, is more likely to happen um, when it comes from a person who is claiming to be aware or get to understand someone who's living and experience from a marginalized community. So believe queer and trans people when they disclose to you about their frustrations or things that are making them uncomfortable 
and also be honest with yourself and the work that you need to continue to do um, to be your best self. Be radically honest with yourself, um, recognizing all the many ways that microaggressive behavior can happen if you're not ready to take accountability as someone contributing to a trans person or queer person's discomfort in the workplace. So be radically honest with yourself and do the work continually. Mm -hmm. Natalie? Um, I realize that we're, we're, we're speaking with a lot of HR professionals right now. Um, and I've been in both the corporate and nonprofit world. And I think, and y'all might need to forgive me for saying this, I think the human needs to come back into the human relations aspect of HR. Um, there are instances where I have been in in workplaces where HR has used whatever you have told them against you. And instead of trying to benefit and help the employees, they end up, you know, supporting the company or the organization. And I think that HR needs to kind of bring back the human relations aspect um, and understand that you have a variety of folks working at your organization and, and what does it mean to be an organization that supports its employees. Um, because regardless, you know, living in a capitalistic society and all these other things, right? Like you want folks to be at work and be productive. And a lot of times that means that like their health is being taken care of. They're being paid appropriately and they're able to show up on time and do those things. Um, and so I do understand the frustrations of being, you know, LGBTQ and, and going to HR and requesting things and being denied. And I think it's HR, you know, kind of being more open and understanding taking trainings, you know, to heart, um, trying to figure out what exactly do companies and organizations stand for. I know specifically um, the question in the chat, I think was, you know, asking about like health insurance and those type of things. And mm -hmm. it's like talking to your HR person to figure out what things are allowed in, in the plans. Um, I know uh, many organizations, it's a matter of opting in. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. for private organizations, it's a matter of opting in to choose to cover that information. Um, also for folks who are, who are currently doing that with the workplace and fighting, I do suggest reading up on some of both the federal, specifically the federal, mm -hmm. um, ordinances that have been passed, um, and look to see what conversations are currently happening in your state around these issues. Folks have seen it. Folks are bringing it up. Folks are fighting. Mm -hmm. So understand that there are things in motion, regardless, I mean, there's no telling how long it may take, but there are things in motion. Um, and that if specifically your needs are not being met, uh, not all of your needs are being met by your insurance, definitely see what needs can be met by your insurance. Mm. Um, you'd be surprised working with your doctors and working with your medical professionals, what can and can't be covered with in health insurance that you might not think of. Um, but again, it's all about folks <laughs> taking in grace and understanding that like, living your best life to the fullest is the key and what can you do to support that mm -hmm. and also programs like this happening today thank you for this making it possible so gloria yes uh, being out there in the workforce you know first of all i tell everybody you know get an education be able to stand up and do your best and when you do that people respect you much more because uh there's always a different uh, alignment of different jobs you know i worked in the medical field and my job became so good for me and the people enjoyed the work that i did because I was uh, dedicated to my job and um, I wanted to be the best that I could be. And I want people to know, no matter what field that you are in, stand up, be the best, and be lovable. I like that. Well. As we get near the end, I was going to just double check back with Wendy if there's anything we else we need to cover. And, and then I have 1, 1 final question for you, Gloria, before we sign off. Wendy, anything okay. you need to are we good? Yes, at this point. Okay. Well, 1 thing we want to do for sure um, is that we want to make sure we have the link for this film 
Glory, your film, but also there's some other links that we have, the Transgender Law Center, the, the National Center for Transgender Equality, um, Sylvia Rivera Law Center, there's some others, and of course the LGBTQ Center of, North, of uh, Durham, thinking about where we are in the state of North Carolina. But I really am impressed, and I'll, I'll add my age, I'm 72, I just turned one. Any Scorpios out there besides me, perhaps? But I was just sitting here thinking about the importance of these kinds of conversations is so critical. You know, and, and also in times of COVID, we'll be going into almost year number two of how many times these conversations happen to happen like this versus in person. So Gloria, I wanna ask you this final question, unless Natalie or Vanity, you have anything, final thing you'd like to say, cause I've got to ask Gloria this question and we're ready to sign off and people can get back to doing whatever they were doing. Anything else you want on any last statement from you, Natalie? So Gloria, here's the question for you. What's next? If, what's next for Gloria Allen? What up? What you going to be doing? What's, what's the what's the future going for you, or what you going to be doing, Gloria? What's next for me is that uh, I want to still be out in the world, you know, doing what I do, spread the joy and the love, and be successful. I'm so proud of myself now, you know, I waited to get my age, you know, I've been out there a long time. I've been through some hardships and uh, I've learned from all the mistakes that I've made how to be a better person. And I know I'm a better person because I strive for that. And the future for me holds a great deal because I want to get out and share my love with everybody. And I want the world to know, you know, when God made us, he didn't make no mistake, you know, and we should realize that. And um, I want to be able to be in different organizations to talk about the awareness of the trans people. And uh, because we are gifted, we are talented, we are beautiful, and we need to realize that. And uh, I'm just so proud and happy that I'm here and I'm still striving to do the best that I can do. Ooh. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us today for our virtual EEOC Network Lunch and Learn uh, and, and, and in observance of Transgender Awareness Week. And again, this has been a conversation with Gloria, Mama Gloria Allen. And one reminder for folks who are going to be around, Natalie, what is the uh, date and time for the Trans Day of uh, Remembrance this Saturday here in Durham? Yes, it'll be this Saturday, November 20th um, in Durham, North Carolina at the Durham Central Park from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Great. I'll turn it back to you, Wendy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Mandy. Thank you. I have enjoyed this conversation and it's been um, it's been one that's been eye opening for me because I, I love to hear from the perspective of our elders because they give us so much knowledge in how to conduct ourselves and, and go in and not repeat history, but make a, a stronger future from that past. And so I'm just very glad to have um, Mama Gloria here today and speaking with us as well as um, Natalie and Vanity uh, to give all of their perspectives on, on uh, just the, the views and the thoughts of uh, the transgender community but as well just their views overall on, on things. And um, again, we are observing Transgender Awareness Week uh, coming up here. And again, I'm just glad that we were able to, to have um, all of our panelists here today. But if you can, please go out and attend some of these events and we will um, make sure that we get this information out to you. Look to hear from me to get the recording uh, from this session today. And in the message, you will also have links for the trailer that was shown um, during the during the session. 
because the trailer may not come up on the on on the actual uh, playback. So make sure that you look for the trailer and all of the uh, ref resources that we're going to send to you because this will be very helpful for you. And again, uh, we'd like to just say thank you for attending our lunch and learn events. And you will look to hear from me to hear about any future events that we have. So on behalf of the state. Of, um, of the Office of State Human Resources, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out today and, and listening to our Lunch and Learn. And again, uh, for our panelists, thank you for participating. And we look to hear from all of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you.